how are the instructions for making proteins encoded on DNA? Again, there were a number of really seminal experiments involved in decoding this, many of which happened on the UW-Madison campus, actually. But let's skip straight to the actual steps. So we're going to start with um, an entire molecule of DNA. And here I've shown both of the strands. Um, and so now let's walk through the process of taking this DNA and making it into a protein. So the first step is that the two strands actually separate from each other. And I've already go gone ahead and um, indicated that here. We'll call the top strand the coding strand and the bottom strand the template strand for reasons that will become ap apparent momentarily. Next, um, a, um, uh, an enzyme called an RNA polymerase shows up. It attaches to the template strand and it transcribes this template strand into RNA. And so I'll go ahead and do that here. G A A A A U G A U U A G three prime. Good. Um, and you'll note that the, the sequence of the RNA, which was made using the template strand, right? The template strand was the template for synthesizing the RNA. The sequence of the RNA is exactly the same as the coding strand sequence, with the notable exception, um, exception that every time there's a thymine in the coding sequence, the base in the RNA is a uracil instead. And so now, at least in a eukaryotic organism that has a nucleus, that RNA moves out of the nucleus. It gets transported out of the nucleus. And so I'll go ahead and reproduce it one more time out here. G A U U A G 3 prime. There we go. And so now a process called translation happens. And so a ribosome, a macromolecular machine that does this, shows up and it decodes every three bases called a codon into an amino acid. And it does this with the help of an adapter molecule called a transfer RNA or a tRNA. And so that tRNA has an anticodon, which is, sorry, not a G there, a C there, has an anticodon that is on one end that is um, complementary to the codon of the RNA, and on the other end of that transfer RNA is amino is an amino acid, and so this one is a methionine, and so this anticodon is CUU, and its amino acid is a glutamate. This one is CUG and its amino acid is an asparagine. Uh, I got that wrong, sorry about that. It's not C-U-G, it is T-T-A. That's right, this one is C-U-G, and the amino acid this encodes for is an aspartic acid, and the UAG is a stop codon. So, a couple of things to note about this. First, the start codon is almost always an AUG. For, our, for all intents and purposes, at least in this course, it is always an AUG, which means that the amino acid that starts the protein is always a methionine. Second, Stop codons. A, a UAG is a stop codon. Did we add an amino acid there? No. The stop codon is a signal to the ribosome that it is time to stop making amino acids. I'm sorry, stop making, stop adding amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain. And the final thing is if you look up the amino acid 
um, the code on table in your textbook or on the internet, you'll find that most amino acids are actually encoded by multiple codons. And so, for example, if I change GAC to GAT, that means that CTG gets changed to CTA, which means that GAU of the RNA gets changed to GAT. I'll go ahead and change that here as well, which means the anticodon is not CUG, it is CUA. However, this tRNA, this codon, still codes for aspartic acid. It still codes for aspartate. So, this process, transcription, translation, takes DNA and shows us how DNA serves its third purpose, right? It directs the DNA carries genes that direct the function of the cell because those genes encode instructions for making proteins. Not just enzymes like Beetle and Tatum found, but every protein in your cell has instructions that are encoded on that cell's DNA. And these instructions here are first transcribed into messenger RNA and then translated into polypeptides, which fold up into proteins. And I'll note that there are other functional sequences of DNA as well, right? It's not just the instructions that encode the proteins that are important, and we're actually going to see examples of that as the semester progresses. But now, we're finally ready to answer the question, what exactly is a mutation? And how does that mutation disrupt the function of a protein?